Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, creator, and chief cat herder. I'm very glad to see and hear all of you today. We have a very exciting topic with two awesome guests. So let's plunge in. Before we go too far, let me explain a bit about the forum, where it came from, how it works, who supports it, how the technology functions, and then we'll introduce this week's guests. So <clears throat> to begin with, you should know the forum is a discussion-based area. What I'm doing right now with this slide here only happened for a minute. Once we start the introductions, once the introductions are done, we're going to proceed entirely to conversation, hopefully through video. Uh, that's a spinoff from another project called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report, or FTTE. Now, that's a monthly trends analysis that takes a look at the major trend lines reshaping higher education as we know it. If you haven't seen it, go to FTTE.us. You can find some sample issues to download or subscribe if you like. Now, the FTTE report and this Future Transform are part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. If you haven't seen that, this is a participatory, ongoing, multimedia, multimodal attempt to grapple with higher education's future. We have a forum, we have the FTTE report, we also have a blog, a book club, and a bookstore, along with something else coming on down the pipe very soon this summer. So if you haven't gone there, go to futureofeducation.us and take a look. Now, we can only do this work with the very kind and generous support of certain sponsors, and I'd like to thank them before we proceed. So to begin with, I'd like to thank NyserNet from New York State, a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges, universities get online and do great things with network technology. They do wonderful work in New York State, and we're really grateful to NyserNet for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So if you're new to it, or if you haven't been here for a while, let me just explain how this works. It's a video conferencing platform, but it's got some differences from the others. To begin with, where I am right now, and where this slide is just for a moment, is called the stage. And it's called that because everyone can see and hear everything that goes on the stage. Right below us, you can see around you up to about 20 different icons. Each of those represents a single sign-in, typically one person or a couple of people from somewhere in the world. And I think of that as, a, as the audience swarm. And if you look at it, you'll see them moving around back and forth. If you'd like to learn more about one of those other sign-ins, just mouse over it and you'll get a little bit of information. If you'd like to talk with them, double-click on them, and if they want to talk to you, your two icons will snap together like Legos. You can have your own private audio-visual conversation. Now, there are a lot of ways to participate in the overall conversation, and I want to show you three. They're all located on the bottom of the screen. You'll see running along it a white strip. And there are several buttons. On the left edge, you'll see what looks like a number along with a silhouette of some people. I've got the number 42 right now. If you click on that, up will pop two different windows. The window on the left will give you a little bit more information about everybody else who is here in today's conversation. On the right will be a chat box, and it's just a classic text chat box where you can type in questions, comments, jokes, URLs, or whatever. That goes to the roughly 19 or so people who have logged in with you this afternoon. So if you'd like, it's a good place for informal conversation, uh, for batting around ideas, for trying out questions. So take a look at that. Now, back to that white strip. The two most powerful buttons are a kind of question mark and a raised hand. If you click on that question mark, up will pop a little box that lets you type in a question or a comment that you'd like me to read out loud to the entire group. I also flash that on the screen so everyone else can see it. And that's a good thing to do if you don't have a camera or a microphone, or if you are in a spot where you can't talk out loud, like you're on a train or something. Um, that's a really good way. And you'll see during this hour, people will submit questions and comments that way. But if you do have a microphone and camera, and you can speak out loud like I'm doing right now, go back to that white strip and look at that raised hand button. If you click that, that tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. And so when the time is right, I'll beam you up on stage. And you can be here just like me in the same size avatar, if not bigger. And you can have a conversation with myself and most importantly with the two other guests. It's really easy to do. In fact, we can have up to four people up here at one time. So you can have me, yourself, and the two authors for today. So think of this as a kind of pop-up panel for conversations. So 
through video, through that text. There are a lot of ways to participate. If that's not enough, you can go to another tab or another browser or another device, head over to Twitter, and just use the hashtag FTTE. And you'll see, in fact, right now, someone's already tweeted with a screenshot of what's going on. And we find people will sometimes uh, put questions and comments there. Sometimes people who can't make it to the event, maybe for bandwidth reasons or for technical limitations, but they'll still put questions and comments there. I'll be checking the uh, FTTE hashtag as we go. So those are all the ways you can participate. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making available the technology we're using to make it all happen. We're also grateful to one last group of people who we really, really love, and that's our supporters on Patreon. If you haven't seen this, Patreon is a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or GoFundMe. It lets people contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep some project going. In this case, the project is the Future of Education Observatory, including the Future Transform. So if you look at the screen, you'll see a screenshot of the leading contributors, leading Patreons. Uh, wonderful people like uh, Michael Haggins and Corey S., Chris Lott, wonderful folks. Um, join them if you can. Go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander and see if you can help out. We really appreciate it. We're really grateful to our Patreons for their help. Now, that's how the technology works. That's who contributes to making it all possible. And that's the mission of the Future Transform. Now, I'm delighted to introduce this week's guests. We have two wonderful people um, who are authors of a brand new book on blended learning. Now, blended learning is a topic we've visited several times, and we will be returning to it many more times in the future, I'm sure. So I'd like to then welcome up a couple of the authors. Let's see if we can bring in, first of all, Amanda Madden, uh, who is a visiting lecturer in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. Amanda, can you see and hear us? Just give her a second for the connection to come to. Hello, Amanda. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to see you here. And I, I have to ask, as a book person, to your left, is that a wall full of books? It is. Uh, it is a well full of books, yeah. I admire you. I admire your taste. Uh, whoa! Oh, all right. <laughs> Keep that on. Forget you. I'll just stare at the books. Um, <laughs> you're welcome, Amanda. I'm very glad you could make it. Are, you. are you on campus at Georgia Tech right now? No, I'm actually at home. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, while we've thank got, you. Well, let's, of course. While we've got you here, let me bring up your co your colleague, co-author and partner in crime. Let's see if I can get Rob up here. And so if you're new to the forum, if you're new to the Shindig technology, this is how we can have multiple people at one time. Hello, Rob. Rob, can you see and hear us? I can. Can you see and hear me? With absolute precision. So glad. Yeah. To okay, good. Welcome. Welcome. And where are you today, Rob? Uh, I'm in my home office now. And where is that? Uh, in Atlanta. Very good. Very good. So we have two Georgians and me coming to you from a little bit to the north. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. So uh, I'm delighted that you both could make it. Thank you. Um, and congratulations on your new book. Thanks. That's Thank be you. Great. It has to be enormously exciting to see. And your book it is enormously out. exciting. And uh, it wouldn't have been possible without our co-editors and the support of the Center for 21st Century Universities, um, as well as the authors, um, the multiple authors in the book. So we're very fortunate. It was a really great project. Well, the Center for 21st Universities does great stuff. Um, we've mm -hmm. had Rich Mello as a guest twice now on the forum. He's yeah. uh, a wonderful writer and a great organizer, just a wonderful thinker, very bold innovator. Um, mm -hmm. let, let me ask, just uh, in fact, typically if you're new to the forum, I usually start off with a couple of basic questions and then participants, okay. the rest of you will all have questions and comments. And typically I start, however, I don't have the chance to start because already questions have come in, which is remarkable. It tells me something about blended learning. Uh, this is a question from the uh, excellent Steve Ehrman, uh, who says, It'll be important to clarify right at the start how the research defines and constrains the term blended learning. Blended learning has so many accepted definitions that research findings about it are almost impossible to interpret without knowing what the investigator ruled in and ruled out. So where did you end up in that definitional question? 
Um, do you want to start, Rob, or do you want well, me to? Why don't you start, and I'm going to pull, I've got my book here, and okay. I'll pull up the mixed taxonomy <laughs> so that we can yes. point that out to people. Yeah, that would be excellent. Um, that is a really good question, and it's one of the questions that we grappled with from the beginning is how do you define blended learning? What's the difference between you know the various types of online learning, hybrid learning? Um, what's the difference between that and face-to-face -face versus you know just using certain types of technology in the classroom? Um, one of our co-editors actually had, had done quite a bit of research on the topic and came up with what we call the mixed taxonomy. Uh, Rob, do you have that up I yet? I have it here. I don't know how well okay. you all can see that. Wow. Uh, but just to give a quick description of the, the axes on here, we have uh, one axis that moves from receiving content to applying content, and then another one that goes from delivery via instructor to delivery via technology. And uh, so there's a range of different uh, styles from flipped learning and, and everything else that you would find in this taxonomy. And uh, conveniently, uh, since Lauren Margelu, one of the co-editors, uh, was also a co-author of that taxonomy, we were able to um, uh, uh, place each of the chapters in the book uh, on that taxonomy and show where, where it falls on those two different axes. Very cool. However, I, I want to make sure I get the name right. Was it MIX or MIX? MIX, MIX taxonomy. Yeah, M-I-X, yeah. Mm -hmm. MIX taxonomy. Really? Well, people need to see that image. And uh, congratulations as book uh, organizers to have all of your articles plugged into that. That's pretty handy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that we had discovered at Georgia Tech too is we were defining blended learning um, because we had at least a couple of our contributors worked with MOOCs. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. blending their classes and really bringing MOOCs into the classroom for blended learning did change things a bit for them. So, and, you know, sort of, it, it, it uh, um, nuanced the definitions of blended learning a lot. Well, not a lot, but some. So um, that was one of the things that we, we grappled with in the introduction is what are the definitions? Um, how do you define that? And the mixed taxonomy was one of our answers to that question. So those two axes have to do with delivery of content. And mm -hmm. uh, what was the first one? I'm sorry, it was? Uh, it, it was uh, the, the type of content and the delivery uh, via the instructor or the uh, right. or technology. Very good, very good. Excellent, well, Steve Ehrman, thank you for the excellent question, well-timed. And uh, thank you both for the, uh, for the rich answer pointing to the uh, real complexity of ways that we can implement blended learning. Um, Friends, I will have all kinds of questions, um, but your job is to, answer, is to ask your questions. Also, if you'd like to just make comments based on your own experience of blended learning, say your, com your experience with uh, offering blended learning or your experience in uh, implementing it or taking it as a student. Um, we have one question that already came up from Gloria Dougherty, and let me just put this on the screen so you can all see it. Uh, how is competency-based education affecting blended learning especially in designing engagement? Good question, Lauren. That is an excellent question because- Yeah, I'm gonna- so, Do you mind if I'm I take it? Yeah. yeah, I'll have you take it, Rob. I think this is, I think this is definitely your area of expertise. <laughs> uh, well, I'm getting there anyway. Uh, but, you know, of course, with, with competency-based education, what we're seeing is um, credit uh, for things that um, uh, th the experiences or the competencies that people bring to their education and having a way to get uh, credit sort of like for prior learning or for on the job uh, learning or something like that. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, blended learning kind of lends itself to in that respect is uh, almost like an open forum uh, experience. So let's say that you have a blended class where you have uh, some of the content is being delivered uh, by video technology, let's say, uh, but then you are having um, open sessions, face-to-face -face sessions, where um, students could come in at any point in their learning path and interact with others, uh, interact with the professor and, and work on problems. So it, I, I think the, the interesting dynamic with competency-based education that we're going to be seeing uh, is that people aren't always going to be at the same exact point uh, along a path. 
And so do we end up with a more uh, sort of open project uh, or that we're all working on at different places or an open question that we're trying to solve and and I'm looking at it from where I am in the content and you're looking at it from where you are in the content. Um, but I think it's really wide open. There's a lot that, that can be done with that. Well, very good. Um, that's a great question. And thank you for the for the answer. It's quite sort of the strategy here. Before we go further, and I'll give people a chance to start thinking of uh, more of their questions, and while I put off my own questions, let me ask you uh, a professional uh, question. What are you two working on for the rest of the year? Now this book project is down the sluice ways and in the world. What's what's leading it? Uh, Amanda, I know you're an expert in early Italian uh, literature or early, early Italian history. So I expect you're gonna do a new book on the Sicilian Vespers, am I right? <laughs> That's a little past my time period. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little past my time period. Um, good question. Um, right now, I'm doing some work in the digital humanities um, and digital humanities and education, how you incorporate incorporate digital humanities and education. Um, that's my next sort of educational project. Um, and I'm finishing my book on violence in early modern Italy. So that's my that's my big project for the year. Excellent, excellent. Well, good luck with both of those. Thank you. And how about you, Rob? What are you working on? Oh, um, well, uh, I, I, I just took this position with the Strata Institute for the Future of Work just a couple of months ago. Uh, and so I am, I'm getting my feet wet in that position. But I can tell you that much of the, uh, the work that we're doing um, shares a lot of similarities to work that Georgia Tech has been doing. So, for example, uh, we're looking at the sort of changing landscape of jobs and education where people are going to be uh, working longer through their lives and will have a number of different careers over that time. Right. And um, that there's going to be sort of this cyclical process of you get an education and then you work for a while and then jobs and, and technology changes and you have to go back and get some more education and then you work again. And that's so Georgia Tech has been uh, attacking that issue with their commission on creating the next in education. Uh, mm -hmm. And at Strata, we're, we're looking at it in a, in a very similar way, except uh, we're going beyond just the university to also look at uh, boot camps or uh, mm -hmm. what we call on ramps. Uh, on ramps are sort of uh, uh, training programs for people who have limited education, but need to get some sort of a new job skills so that they can move into a, a, a new part of their, their lives, a, a new portion of their lives. Um, so that's, that's many, in many ways, the kinds of things that we're going to be attacking for the rest of, of 2019. Well, congratulations on your move to uh, Strada, by the way. Um, Thanks. Yeah. I think, uh, perhaps in a, in a subsequent session, we'd like to follow up with your thoughts about the future of work when you get a chance. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of work, we have another question that's just come up from the awesome Kelly Walsh. Uh, Kelly is uh, someone who's done a lot of work in blended learning. And he says he's curious to hear what kinds of things Rob and Amanda learned that in their blended learning research were most surprising or most unexpected. Um, I guess I'll start with that one. Um, one of the things that I learned that was most surprising about blended learning was how great it was for student engagement. Um, I came into blended learning like most people um, as an instructor, I was looking for interesting things to do with my students. I was trying to get them more engaged. Um, I was experimenting and um, I realized um, when I did a more blended hybrid classroom that the students were incredibly engaged. And mm. um, that led into, I mean, I, I, I typically teach first year writing courses, which are required. So sometimes the students like them, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just realistic. Um, and so, you know, I recognize that, you know, kind of mixing up the format a bit, the students were more engaged um, and invested in the material. So my contribution in the book is uh, the one I worked on was teaching with um, Assassin's Creed 2, the video game. Yeah. So that's the article that I did in the book. And um, that's what I used as sort of my, my version of blended learning is having them play a video game as their sort of textbook interactive textbook um, and the students the students loved it i mean it was really really effective yeah. in the classroom. so they did that they did that wait they, they played the game in the class or out of the class both both and yeah. assassin's creed 2 covers if i remember right, the second crusade 
Uh, it covers the uh, Italian Renaissance. So. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I must be. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. You get to uh, at the end. There's a there's a boss fight with a pope, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. That's in Brotherhood. So that's a sequel to Assassin's Creed too. But yeah, he he's in a boss fight with the <laughs> the Borgia Alexander. Yeah, Alexander the Pope. Yeah. So. so so to so the key thing for you was the engagement that students were much more engaged. Absolutely. Uh, and that's a key thing. That's a really really important takeaway. Um, Rob, how about you? What did you find that was most surprising or unexpected? Uh, for me, uh, it was uh, somewhat uh, of a professional development experience working on the book because I was. Uh, surprised when Amanda asked me to, to join on to the project uh, at how many different types of blended learning there are. Um, the, the work that I had done in it previously, uh, I, I should mention that I'm an adjunct faculty member at the University of Colorado, Denver, uh, where I used to live in Denver. And, and I had, uh, I'm still teaching online for them, but about 10 years ago, I was doing some that were more along the flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so video instruction and then uh, homework in the classroom. And to, that was sort of my blinders was, oh, that's blended learning. And then when we started working on the book and we started getting these chapters submitted by different faculty members from around Georgia Tech, and I was like, wow, I can't believe, you know, this person is doing diagramming. Uh, this person uh, is is sharing help desk resources between an online section of a course and a face to face section of a course, um, and and another person, uh, two professors who are in the School of Public Public Affairs, who were teaching a blended course with uh, students at Georgia Tech along with students students at Science Po in Paris, mm -hmm. and they were online at the same time and in a forum kind of similar to this, talking mm -hmm. through global affairs problems and. And it just blew my mind as to how many different ways we can uh, we can integrate technology and learning. Okay, so that that almost sounds like two different surprises. I mean, one is that the transition from uh, flipped classroom to blended learning is not a simple or a direct one, mm -hmm. and the second is that what you observed in blended learning was actually quite extraordinarily diverse. It wasn't a unitary yes. perfect thing, but there were many many practices under that header. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, that's very important. Uh, having finished the book, do you do you is is there any kind of synthesis that you can describe? Is there any kind of overall way of describing what you just um, uh, reported on, uh, or is it really too diverse? Is it like saying you know describe print to me? Um, I guess. I'll, yeah, go ahead, man. I guess I'll start with that one. Um, I think that we've already hit on the key point. Is uh, there? And as Rob brings up, there are many, many different variations, um, many, many different variations of blended learning, uh, of blended learning, what that means. Um, and finding a common thread through them, um, I think, has a lot to do with um, motivations for blending the classroom. And I most of the and that was the really fantastic part about working on the book is all of the instructors we, we worked, you know, that contributed chapters were really interesting, interested in better learning outcomes, whether right. it was engagement, per, better performance on the test, you know, um, so on and so forth, that, that they really just wanted students to do better in their classes. Um, so that, that was one of the common themes. And the other common theme was, you know, as I found in my class and they found, you know, across the board, is students were doing better in the blended classroom. Um, you know, and Georgia Tech, because it's a technological university and, you know, a lot of classes do tend to be face to face um, and have traditionally be face to face. It was kind of a we had some professors who really were kind of walking into walking into it for the same time. and We're doing lots of experimentation oh. um, and, you know, just even just reading their chapters. I mean, that's one thing that, that comes across in all the chapters are like, wow, this is fantastic. Um but I think one of the takeaways we talk about a lot is like, it's hard, it's not easy to do. Um, and it's important to, you know, talk to other professors, do a little bit of reading up, reading up on it, seek a support system and expect it to be mm. difficult to do the first time. Um, mm. The second thing we found was like, you know, if you can do some basic <laughs> research on it, that way you can track, you know, improvements in t t quiz scores, you know, maybe do like a, an A-B testing where you're doing, one you know, good one yeah, 
Yeah, that sort of stuff. And it's really, those are pretty simple interventions um, and research, you know, studies to do. Um, and that way, you know, you can, you can keep track of, of where things are going. Um, so that, that, that was at least two of our takeaways. I know Rob has more. I'll just add one other, which is um, that, it, as Amanda was saying, it, it is challenging, uh, it, especially for someone who's never done it before. And if you're thinking, I'm going to try to blend my classroom, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we noticed come up uh, over and over again in our discussions with the authors was uh, institutional support. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Having the support from whether it's your department uh, or, or your college or university in general to have, for example, release time if you need it so that you can spend a semester creating the content for your course uh, or having uh, grants, uh, you know, um, where, where uh, the faculty might be able to get a little bit of money to hire uh, a, a student assistant who can work with them on, on setting up the course and, and getting the technology rolling. So um, mm -hmm. the, to the extent that the institutions can support people in this, uh, I think is, is only going to make it better and make blended learning uh, take off faster. Well, and we saw at Georgia Tech, I mean, you know, resources is a big issue, I mean, for everyone, whether, you're at, you know, a large private university with, you know, a large endowment and lots of resources to, you know, a small state school, you know, or community college. I mean, resources is something that all of us, you know, have to grapple with. Um, and so that was another one of the interesting things we saw that was a thread of the book is like, some people had MOOCs that were funded by grants that they developed, you know, which had those resources. Um, some people, you know, just sort of like recorded a couple videos on their own or, you know, just did these really basic, easy things to do that involved, you know, just moving the classroom about a bit, um, you know, older classrooms, um, you know, and we had really everything in between. And, you know, we had, you know, there was some skepticism in, you know, certain places and there was, you know, full support in other places. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to do blended learning research, you know, and, and document, you know, that it is a, a fairly successful um, method of teaching. Um, because, you know, then you can say to administrators, look, we have all these great outcomes. What can we do to, you know, devote, devote more resources here? Mm -hmm. Do you find, um, have you found any institution that does this well at scale? You know, a lot of what you described is individual faculty, individual classes. Is there any university or college that has a good programmatic way of doing this across campus? I don't know that I could name one off the top of my head, although I can say that there are folks who are real champions of this. For example, uh, Chuck Zubin, is at uh, UCF, Central Florida, um, and uh, has an entire institute that works on blended learning. And so uh, where you see schools that, that put that kind of support into it, that they're gonna have a, a research institute devoted to it, uh, you know, I think is, is going to have an impact on uh, being able to do that at a, at a, a much faster pace, a larger uh, rate for course adoption. It may just take a, a hero like Chuck to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, a whole stack of questions that have been flooding in, so let me bring these up as well. And uh, friends, if your uh, camera and mic are uh, working and you either are in a, uh, uh, if you're in an office space like um, Amanda and uh, Rob and I are in, please, uh, please feel free to raise your hand so you can uh, join us on stage. Uh, we have a question from the wonderful Roxanne Riskin, longtime friend of the program, who asks, can you discuss a few of your favorite digital engagement tools that you're using for active student learning? Rob, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, I have to say, actually, one of my favorites, and I'll, I'll name a new one here in a second, but one of my favorites still is Amanda's chapter about using Assassin's Creed 2. Um, that's just the coolest thing. Um, but uh, one of the things that I have tried in my classes uh, with varying degrees of success is Twitter, uh, actually, and having uh, Twitter chats uh, with my students on a particular topic. And we've, we've tried it where it's been, um, you know, asynchronous, and we just say, here's this hashtag for the course. 
Uh, and I actually, at one point, I, I had put a widget on my course homepage that, that you know, had a feed for that hashtag uh, coming up. Um, but uh, we, we, we tried that asynchronously, and then we also a couple of times tried to do it synchronously, where we said, well, I'll be on Twitter at a particular hour, and let's discuss, uh, you know, whatever topic was that, that we were covering. Everybody just add this hashtag and, and search for it as we're, as we're going. Um, but I, I don't know if I could say that it was entirely successful, but it certainly got the students interested uh, because, and this was, um, this was about five years ago, so it, Twitter was a little bit less um, controversial, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. as, a, as a teaching tool. Um, back then, but uh, but it, it worked it worked fairly well at that time. Um, and just two quick questions. Uh, first, did you do that inside the class or outside the class hours? Uh, this was outside uh, outside of the meeting time. So it was giving us an opportunity to uh, they would they would watch the videos that I had posted for the content, read the materials, and then we would jump on Twitter and uh, and fire questions and and you know Got discussion it. responses. And uh, I mean, Amanda mentioned teaching a first grade writing class. Uh, what was the topic of that class? I'm sorry, what'd you say? I said, Amanda, you mentioned, well, hello, Kitty. <laughs> I know, I've been trying to keep her away, but she really wants to join us. We're, we're big fans of Bob here. But what's, what's her name? <laughs> Maya is her name. Hello, Maya, goddess of illusion. <laughs> Welcome. Um, but you mentioned that you were teaching a writing class, a first year writing class. Rob, which, what was the content of the class that you were teaching on Twitter? Um, on that one, it was a sociology of education course. Oh, very appropriate. Very appropriate. Um, mm-hmm. Amanda, did you want to add any of your, your, your favorite blended learning engagement tools that you either used or that came up in the course of the book? Absolutely. Um, sorry, she's really wanting to help me. Um, oh, <laughs> um, I really do like teaching with video games as, as text. Um, Mm -hmm. not as video games. I think those are really, really fun and rewarding. Um, And needless to say that the Ubisoft Assassin's Creed series is fantastic for that, particularly for someone who teaches history classes. Um, Or, you know, history or even just writing classes. Um, Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite tools right now is, um, it sounds really simple, but Google Docs. Like Ooh. my students, you put them on Google Docs, um, particularly when you're doing collaborative writing or you're doing uh, peer writing or, you know, give, they're doing sort of work where they can they can uh, um, work on stuff together. But then I can jump in and, you know, make comments to them and, and you know, ask them questions. Um, that's been very productive for me. Um, and it's such a simple and easy tool to use when you're working with students on their writing. Um, and, you know, you can do it asynchronously and say, okay, guys, I'm, you know, I'm going to be in and out of your document in the next couple of days, you know, just, you know, keep writing and I'll, I'll check in and, you know, just kind of see what's going on. So I, I like Twitter too. I haven't, I haven't used it as much as Rob has in the classroom. Um, I also like having students, and I found this really successful, I also like having students um, record their own videos. Um, Mm -hmm. So kind of flipping it in that way and having students just, you know, using a basic camera, having students like, you know, record lectures for themselves or, you know, record lectures to their students, um, to other students and, you know, kind of have them flip the classroom a little bit. Mm, Very nice. In terms of Mm -hmm. student creativity and student agency. Thank you for these uh, answers. And Roxanne, what a, what a great question. We have more that have come up. In fact, uh, let me bring up this one. Um, this is from, uh, let's see, Marsha um, uh, Schwanke at uh, Syracuse University. And she asks, how is accessibility and universal design being incorporated into blended learning? Good question. That's a really good question. Um, Rob, do you want to take this or do you want me sure. to take this? I, I could, I'll start off. You could jump in. Um, one of the things that we have uh, tried to pay attention to uh, at Georgia Tech was with the uh, with the professors who were using uh, MOOCs as the basis for the content delivery. Um, it was uh, it's it's one of the nice features about platforms such as edX and Coursera is that uh, when the videos are being displayed, there's also a clickable transcript that runs along the side of the video. And so you can read what the professor's saying. And if you 
if you didn't catch something or you need to see an explanation, you can even click a couple of sentences back and the video will jump back to that spot. Um, so, so in that sense, I think we, it was a real boon to, to the professors who were using the MOOC as the basis um, in that they could uh, help hearing impaired students to still be able to follow through. Um, but uh, at the same time, there are still a number, you know, obviously hearing impairment isn't the only challenge here, and we want to make sure that everybody is is uh, is being included. And so um, that's, that's I, I don't know that I have a really good answer for that, except to say that um, it's a, a, a topic that definitely needs to be addressed. Um, and usually it needs to be addressed on the technology side of things. The face-to-face -face side Usually, if you've got a student who um, who has some sort of disability, they've already been to Disability Resource Services or whatever the office might be called. You get a letter as the professor, and it says these are the things the student needs. Whether or not you can apply that then to whatever the technology delivery is, that's really the challenge that, that you have to make sure to address. Well, it's a grand topic uh, with an awful lot of ramifications. Uh, that does kind of bring us back to institutional strategy as well. Marcia, thank you for that really good question. Uh, we have another question from uh, Wendy Pratner. Let me bring this up. Uh, Wendy from South Central College asks, Rob's comment a few minutes ago on there being many different ways to design a blended learning experience. Part of the question for me as to how to keep up with all this exciting variety. What recommendations do you have for resources, et cetera? Buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> Buy our book. Um, I, I think that it's becoming such a big topic. It's almost hard to keep track of, um, keep track of all the stuff that's now coming out in blended learning, you know, and the popular press um, and the academic press and so on and so forth. I have a Google alert. Um, that's what I recommend. Mm -hmm. is I have a Google Scholar alert <laughs> that I that I set up for you know various topics that come through and you know tell me hey you'd be interested in these you know five or six articles um, that are coming out. I think probably one of the best ways you know to keep apprised of um, of blended learning is just to talk to colleagues. You know mm -hmm. say hey I've been thinking about doing this. Um, CEDL, the Centers for Teaching and Learning are always great resources because you know. They tend to be really, really aware of what's mm -hmm. going on educationally, um, and I, I think if I if if I were going to talk to a faculty member who was just getting started out and said, "Hey, what can I do? You know, I want to incorporate technology," I would say, "Talk to Cedal and talk to your librarians, because th those are going to be the two people who can really help you out with that stuff." Mm -hmm. Here, here, those paracurricular centers and the libraries, mm -hmm. um, excellent places. L let me ask. Obviously, your book is the best ever published on the subject, but. <laughs> I assume that you have a bibliography that people can draw on as well. Yeah. Are there any other scholarly works that really stand out for you on this subject? Um, there are two, and I'm going to blank on the names of one of them is edited by Chuck Zubin. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and who's the co-editor on that one, Amanda? Uh, DiMaggio? Uh, no. Um, no, and I should I I should have a copy of my book handy. I'm, I'm gonna sorry. find. I, I'm blanking on the name, and but it's yeah. right on the tip of my tongue. But uh, you you vamp, Amanda. <laughs> I'll, I'll find it real quick. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Zubian Zubian obviously is is definitely one of those people who's done a lot of work on the topic. Um, he's done some really fantastic work on the topic. You know. Oh, Anthony Pitiano. That's yeah, it. yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I couldn't come to that. Thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I drew a blank. As soon as you drew a blank, it's contagious. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Picciano does has done a lot of really good stuff on it. So I would I would definitely definitely recommend. I mean, they've been in. We absolutely this book absolutely owes a debt mm -hmm. to what they've done in the field. Um, you know, and if if you ask me to characterize, you know, like our book in the larger picture of things is, um, you know, this stuff that they've done is really foundational. And anyone who wants to look at blended learning should start there. Uh, um, we really did more of like, hey, we wanted to do an institutional approach. You know, this is the range of stuff people do at an institution. And, you know, here's how you can do either really extensive research or here's how you can, you know, use MOOCs if you've got those resources. Um, 
So, but absolutely, you know, their research is, has uh, definitely influenced what we've done with this book. Well, thank you. Um, that's a great question. It's a very practical question. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, we have a couple of, um, in our past, we've had a couple of people who have done uh, some blended learning work, including Kelly Walsh. So if you can take a look at the forum archive, you can find some. And we have a video question here from Tom Riley. Hello, Tom. I'll give him a second for the connection to work. Hello, Tom. Are you there? A couple of points. Uh, after about two years, I, my book finally went to the press yesterday. And if I make minimum wage off the time I put on that sucker, I'll fall out of this chair. <laughs> but because it took so long to go through the editing, we did a whole bunch, worked through a whole bunch of stuff. Stuff that worked, one thing that worked was what's called X Hero where you set up a challenge we set up one of those and got a lot of interest the other one is what to write i write essays i write short stories none yeah. of that's worth a tweedle what you want to write is movie treatments hmm. it's a weird essay about 20 pages that a movie producer if he wanted to could or usually he could turn into a movie but it's no worse to write than short stories or anything. But it's yeah. the one that if it sells, it's $100,000. A uh, group of short stories sells, it's a buck seventy-five. So right. focus on writing movie treatments, not the whole screenplay, just the treatment. And uh, you got a, uh, it's a lottery ticket for a hell of a lot more money than writing technical books that, uh, well, not, uh, and it can reach young people. My yep. technical book ain't going to reach young people. Very yeah, that's much true. So I just Thank you. To say that. Good advice. Thank you. Uh, we have, um, uh, whoops, sorry, we have more questions. Um, and let me just, uh, let me bring up a few of these um, before we go any further. Um, so we have a question here from, um, Oops, hang on a second. Sorry, Rob, accidentally uh, knocked you off stage. Glad you came back. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from George Station, uh, who's a longtime contributor to the program, a good friend. Uh, George asks, who gets blended as curricular innovation that can be more than a scheduling convenience, like space usage, or cash cow, large space, large class section, or as, uh, and who, who doesn't? Is there a discipline divide, or a faculty versus administration? That's a really good question. Um, I would say, um, I, I don't know that there's a discipline divide. Um, I would hesitate, I would hesitate that it's a disciplinary issue. Um, mm. I, I, I have seen I have seen people who have blended their classes in all sorts of disciplines, whether it's from history to, you know, mechanical engineering um, to biomedical engineering, you know, first year writing and so on and so forth. Um, I think the people who are more likely to blend just tend to be, you know, teachers who like to experiment in the classroom um, and who are willing to, you know, kind of experiment and make mistakes and, and try things out. Did you yeah, they have to be risk takers, uh, I think is a big thing because we, we've, we've heard, you know, f stories from various uh, people at Georgia Tech who would not try anything like this, who um, you say that the, 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 the lecture is the way that you deliver content at Georgia Tech and right. nobody's going to take that away from me. And uh, I, I, I obviously will not name any names uh, or even the colleges that they're in, except to say... Um, that my impression of these people when I would see comments like this is that they were not risk takers. They weren't willing to to um, let go of control of how the course was being taught and allow the students to have some of that control themselves. And that's that's something you've got to be able to do with blended learning. That's the key thing is uh, willingness to take risk. Did, have, have you detected any patterns among the population? I mean, do they tend to be... Younger, older, scientists, humanists, tenured, non-tenured, bearded, non-bearded. 
Um, I don't know that I can say for sure. Uh, it, it really runs the gamut, and it's hard. It's hard to pin down a, a specific variable that you might be able to say that's the thing that if it's this way the person will blend, and if it's that way they won't. Because we we see it across the the STEM schools at Georgia Tech, and we see it in the non-STEM schools at Georgia Tech. Um, uh, you know, such as Amanda's school, literature, media, and communication. Um, we we see it with uh, some professors who are. Um, getting close to retirement. Um, I will say, I guess one one thing that we did notice in this is that uh, tenure track faculty who have not yet made tenure seem to be reluctant to try blended learning because it's a time investment and they already have so much else on their plate trying to trying to get to tenure that uh, to, to ask them to try something new uh, is is very challenging for them. But that being said, Lauren Marjolu, one of our, our co-editors here, she's now uh, on the faculty at Georgia State, um, right. and uh, and she's always been teaching with a blended format. So even though she's working towards tenure now, it's mm -hmm. no more or different of an experience for her teaching than it was when she was trying it out as a graduate student. Uh, uh, um, George, it's a typically deep question, one that we really enjoyed, and, and thank you, Amanda and uh, Rob, for diving into this. Um, we have more questions coming up, and uh, friends, we saw with Tom how easy it is to uh, beam you up on stage, so if your camera is working, please let us know. We'd be glad to talk with you. In the meantime, I'll read one from Sierra Adari Tasi Wupa, and if I've mispronounced your name, Sierra, I'm very sorry. Um, blended courses can be anything from meeting twice face-to-face -face during the semester to meeting face-to-face -face every other week. Is there a sweet spot between face-to-face -face and online portions? That's a tough one. Um, That's a really excellent question. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I think it depends on the course, and I think it depends on uh, the material that you need or want to cover. Um, mm -hmm. I've had it, I've seen it work really well as, as little as, you know, 25% um, online or, or asynchronous. Um, David Joyner, one of our contributors, was almost 90% uh, online. So I do think it varies, you know, based on the technology that you want to use or, you know, the subject matter you need to, you need to cover and how you design the class. I will say, I think it can be successful, um, you know, from very low stakes to, you know, using mostly MOOCs to blend your class. Like, I don't, I don't know that there is a happy medium that you need to try and hit if you're going to blend your class. Um, I think the design, the, the important part of the design is, is you do it in a way that works for you. Again, there's a, a really personal touch, which connects back to your uh, call for faculty to work with centers for teaching and learning because they have yeah. that relationship that they can help you based on the specific class. Yeah, absolutely. That's a terrific question. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you uh, for a really detailed answer. Now, we have another question here from uh, the awesome Mark Corbett Wilson. So let me put this up. Um, Mark uh, asks, it's 2019. When will educators stop waiting for the institution to provide professional development, digital technologies, to acknowledge that they are not supporting their digitally fluent students? Here, here. Big That's question. a softball right there. <laughs> 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 oh, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Well, if, if the supple hit it out of the park, what do you think? Um, I think it needs to happen now. Um, I think that um, I think that uh, there is definitely a consensus that um, we tend to be a bit traditional in um, the way that we teach. Um, we're pretty married to the face-to-face -face classrooms for a variety of reasons. Um, I think that it is changing. I do want to, I do think it's changing. I, 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 I would say that, you know, I see colleagues coming up from graduate school who are more invested in, you know, using technology in the classroom um, and have more experience with it. Um, maybe I can sort of give a, an, a list a personal example. When I was starting out teaching, um, I wanted to use Wikipedia in my classroom and mm. 
it was, there was a no, cause I was a graduate student. They're like, no, that's too radical. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> right. And now I've moved to, you know, like teaching with video games or, you know, all sorts of having my students do music videos or podcast. Um, so I would say that I have, I've personally seen like the transition, even in the past, like five, 10 years between, you know, not technologically enabled teaching to highly technologically enabled teaching. And the students, you know, as we all know, the digital natives adapt. This is, this is their, their space. Um, as to how we, you know, say to everyone, like, look, I, I don't know. I think that's a question for the ages. Um, I think a lot of people are rest grappling with that. And I think people have written, you know, literally books on this. Um, and I don't know that there's any one good answer other than doing the research. Uh, administrators like research, you know, the public likes research. People like to see research that says, yeah, this is successful. You know, this really, really works. So I would say do the research, you know, to kind of have something to say here, you know? Um, and you recommended some of that and uh, your book constitutes that. And yeah. then uh, Mark followed up with a simple note. I'll just put this up here. By 2040. <laughs> I mean, that's our goal at Tech, right? <laughs> right. right. I think he knows that. That's um, uh, it's a very good prompt, and that's and that's a really good answer, Amanda. Uh, this, is, this is a deep problem, and I, I hope we're uh, I hope we're all encouraging that. Uh, I, I want you know, speaking of 2040. This is the part in the program, um, and the, towards the very end, where I try to encourage us to look forward a bit more in the future. So here's my provocative question. Is it possible that by 2040 or more likely by 2025, uh, we'll stop saying blended learning uh, because so many classes, so many teaching, so much teaching will already be blended. And that if we're not blending, that will be the interesting and striking, unusual thing that will need a name, whatever the name might be, retro class or you know, stick in the mud pedagogy or whatever. <laughs> I like that retro class. My instructor's doing a retro class. <laughs> that is cool. Uh, my, my, new book, my new book has a, one scenario for the future of universities. It's called Retro Campus. Yeah, you'll see it when it comes out. Um, but I mean, is it, is that possible? I mean, is it possible that blended learning will simply become that widespread that we'll stop calling it something and just call it pedagogy? I don't know. What do you think, Rob? I, th I think so. I think that that's, uh, that's on the horizon uh, for us. Um, and, and, um, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that's going to take a few years to become part of the lexicon. Um, and, and having a conversation like this is a great, uh, you know, a, a great contribution to that because we all start thinking I'm teaching a class. My students are going to be learning the end, you know, and, and we all just assume that when you say that you are going to be marrying, uh, different types of content delivery with the diff different types of instruction. Um, mm -hmm. um, how quickly that happens, um, you know, how quickly these these changes take place, uh, just as with Mark's question previously, uh, I'll just say that um, uh, one of the vice provosts at Georgia Tech, Colin Potts, uh, he said to me once, um, change happens one funeral at a time. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so and it obviously it's very grim, but the more that this becomes normalized, students in K-12 are learning this way. And as they come to expect that in their post-secondary education, uh, and then they go on and become professors themselves, then I think that that, you know, massive shift will will happen. There was a study a few years ago from Ithaca SNR, uh, which looked at innovation at large state flagship universities. And they found that generally speaking, adjunct faculty were more likely to be innovative in the classroom than tenure track faculty. Um, and most people agreed with that, although it seemed, it seemed to, to elicit some howls of dismay. Is, if that's right, um, it, should we think about perhaps uh, taking the CETLs, taking the libraries, taking the blended learning strategies that you so wonderfully described and target them at uh, adjunct at part-time faculty. Uh, would that be perhaps more bang for the buck and a better, faster route to making Mark Corbett Wilson's vision come true? Well, certainly the, the faculties uh, at, at many universities these days are shifting more towards a, a, a 
variety of adjunct faculty and less uh, of the teaching is being placed on the, the tenured faculty. Um, so if, if that trend continues, and I'm not saying whether that's good or bad that it's happening, uh, but if that trend continues, then I think that's definitely an area that would be worth investment. That's one I mean, Please. I, I do think it has a lot, you know, when Rob brought up earlier, he talked about, you know, non-tenured, I mean, faculty on the tenure track um, do tend to be a lot more uh, conservative with their teaching. I, I definitely think that's true. Um, just because the way things are set up, I mean, you know, like if you're, if you're on the tenure track, what gets evaluated is your book. You know, it's or your lab research. It's not your scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, there is a lot of calls out there to reevaluate that. And we've certainly had those conversations at George Tech, like what gets considered like, you know, you can put in your tenure file. Um, so I, I think that's a conversation everyone needs to be having as a profession adjunct, you know, whether the whole adjuncting is, is a whole other conversation. But, you know, what counts? for scholarship, I think is, is important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, this scholarship of teaching and learning, which is just as rigorous, um, yes. needs to count. And yes. I think that we need to ha start having those conversations with administrators and say, Hey, if, if this, if this uh, instructor is putting 25% of their work into like innovative teaching, you need to count that. Yes. I think pretty much everywhere in the U S uh, people express enthusiasm for scholarship of teaching in the glasses category, but, um, but the examples are, are thinner on the ground. Let me let me push you a little bit further forward and into the future uh, with the help of a Georgia Tech um, experiment, and you maybe can guess where I'm going with this. Um, I'm thinking about the impact of AI on blended learning. Um, and Georgia Tech is famous for having Jill Watson uh, oh. pass a limited Turing test as a um, TA chatbot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should, you know, looking ahead to the far distant future of, say, maybe, you know, next February, do you think we'll see, um, do you think you will see AIs being deployed to either as, you know, Jill Watson style experiments or backing up other technologies that will help accelerate and uh, enhance the deployment of blended? I really wish to show our, our other editor was here to answer this question because uh -huh. he's the one who did the Jill Watson experiment <laughs> and oh, he would yeah. have some really interesting things to say about that. Um, Rob, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, if, if, if I can channel Ashok for a minute, uh, I think what he would say is that um, uh, that kind of AI technology needs to be used not as a uh, replacement uh, to learning, but as a supplement uh, for learning. And so uh, having AI chatbots, for example, that can help a student work through a, a problematic uh, topic, um, through a, a sort of Socratic dialogue or something like that. I think that would be, um, that would be welcome, but it would not be used as a way to say, okay, but then we don't, then we don't have to teach them using this other strategy, or we don't have to teach them this other topic. Um, the AI is, is going to have to be another layer on top of, of everything else that we have. Well, that's very good anticipation of this. Um, I have other questions, and the uh, future transform would love to ask more. But we've unfortunately hit the end of our hour. Uh, the two of you, and I should say three of you, because Maya was there. I'm sure we very happy. Maya, <laughs> She's a great teacher. <laughs> oh, I think so. Well, you you've missed my cats. They they usually appear. They're 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 oh. very uh, attuned to the camera, and they'll usually just make, and leap ahead like a furry wave. But, uh, <laughs> But you, you've both been so so generous um, with your time. Oh, thank you. Wonderful project. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with both of you and your respective work? Uh, is it through Twitter or uh, is there some other um, venue we should follow? Um, I, I Twitter. Twitter is um, a good place to keep up with me and my work. Um, yeah. And the Center for 21st U Universities has a Twitter um, as well. Um, and anyone is is welcome to email me. Just, you know, shoot me an email, my personal email address. I'm always happy to talk about it or, you know, make suggestions. Well, that's really kind of you. Uh, so that's Madden Amanda and R Kindle 42, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, thank you both so much. Good luck with uh, the rest of the year and uh, everybody grab their book and make sure your libraries has a copy, have a copy of the book <laughs> as well. But don't go. Don't all leave yet because we have uh, some announcements about the uh, the next week and what we're up to. So let me just bring these up for everyone to hear. 
So um, next week we'll have Kevin de la Plante. Uh, this is a fascinating guest. This is a fellow who left a faculty career in order to start up an entirely online program, the Critical Thinker Academy. Uh, this is an incredibly bold move, an incredibly bold person, and I'm really excited to, get to talk to him as a um, kind of a time traveler from the future of 21st century university teaching. And meanwhile, our book club continues to read. We're getting deeper and deeper to Shoshana Zuboff's Age of Surveillance Capitalism. We've had a lot of comments. This is important stuff. It's getting a lot of attention. In fact, there's already uh, LinkedIn and Facebook fan groups discussing the book. So you can join us. And if you'd like to grab a copy of Zuboff or of the blended learning book you just heard about today, head to our bookstore, the only bookstore on earth that's devoted entirely to the future of education. And if you'd like to keep talking about all these issues, we have lots of ways of doing it. We have groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can find uh, Shindig all over social media, and you can find me on Twitter and on my blog. So in the meantime, thank you so much for coming. You have terrific questions today. I really appreciate them all. And we'll see you online, and then we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.